Hello, my name is Julie Jose. Welcome to How Ancestral Storytelling Establishes Equity in the Classroom, the Indigenous Way of Valuing Culture and Identity. This summer, I spent many hours reading various Indigenous authors, sharing how ancestral storytelling creates a resurgence of tradition and culture. Knowing the unabridged version of one's familial acts of courage and resistance sparks a sense of self-affectation, a political act that resists colonial ways of being. I would discuss how we can bring this kind of resurgence and this kind of equity into our classroom. We begin with land acknowledgement. Take a moment to imagine, to see through the eyes and through the heart of the indigenous families as you read these words with me. We acknowledge that San Joaquin Delta College serves students and the community on the unceded ancestral homeland of indigenous peoples, including the Yokuts, Plains Miwok, Potwin, and Nishinan. This land remains inseparable from its aboriginal stewards. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland, and we wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Yokuts, Miwok, Plains Miwok, Potwin, and Nishinan, affirming their sovereign rights as First People. We remain grateful for the rich culture, language, contributions, and heritage of the First Nation peoples who's lived <clears throat> here and loved here, who raised their families here, who cared for land and life here, who are buried in many marked and unmarked places here, and to their descendants who continue to live on despite acts of genocide, assimilation, and forced removal. <clears throat> Let us honor them, their sacred relationship to this land and to all life, keeping them in our thoughts, words, and actions as for we are guests in this place. There are seven elements that establish an equity-minded classroom. Detailed descriptions of each element can be found in USC's Rossier's School of Education. The link is highlighted in yellow on the upper left-hand corner. In brief, number one, reflect on your own beliefs, your own biases and blind spots. Number two, establish an inclusive environment. Number three, reduce race and gender barriers to learning. Diversify your curriculum. Expose students to a spectrum of stories, writers, and artists that represent them. Establish cultural connection with your students. Number four, be dynamic with classroom space. Avoid authoritative gestures and stance. Move among students. Number five, accommodate learning styles. Learning must be accessible for all. Number six, be mindful of how you use technology. Consider its impact on those with physical disabilities. Number seven, be aware of religious holidays, culture, traditions. Leanne Batasamosaki Simpson, is a Mishi Nishnabek scholar and author. Simpson tells us that ancestral storytelling creates acts of resurgence, a political move that transforms buried shame into a reconciliation of self, a self-affectation that supports and promotes a regeneration of indigeneity, positive ways of being, of being valued, of being recognized. As a result, Storytelling becomes an act of resistance against inequity and racist ideology. One of the stories Simpson shares in her Dancing on Her Turtle's Back is how the Indigenous transformed Ontario's National Aboriginal Day into a day of resurgence by way of a procession, a powwow, a festival of arts and dance to show their families and children that their traditions, their identity, their storytelling are evidences of courage and resilience. Simpson states, if leaders allow injustice to continue, then any dedicated cultural day is nothing but a shallow acknowledgement. And I quote, so leaders can feel less guilty about the continued occupation of their land. Right now, August, 2022, California farm workers are staging a sacrificial 24-day, 335-mile procession 
from Delano to Sacramento to convince Governor Newsom to sign their bill giving farm workers protection from employer intimidation. Like the indigenous, a resurgence is underway by way of a procession, art, song, and Our Lady of Guadalupe at the lead. Organizer Jose Zapata Calderon, Emeritus Professor, emerges, re-emerges, Cesar Chavez's 1966 procession for justice from Delano to Sacramento, which is shown in the black and white image. It is a time for families to tell their children about the sacrifices and resilience of, the, of their predecessors, changing the narrative from that of shame for being a laborer to that of resistance against oppression. This procession ends at the state capitol on August 26, the day Governor Newsom proclaimed Farm Worker Appreciation Day. The farm workers have taken that day and transformed it into a day of resurgence. If the bill is denied, then Farm Worker Appreciation Day becomes a farce, a shallow day created for our leaders to feel good about themselves. Click on the image of either Calderon or of um, the other image here, We Feed You, or the black and white image. And there are some additional greetings for, um, for you. Now, you can also, now if we had breakout rooms, I would ask you a few questions and I'm going to just pose them here. So take a moment to think about these questions or write them down for future use. And the questions are, how can this information be useful to your students? How does it remove the shame of being a farm worker or the product of a farm working family? How does this information respond to one or more of the seven elements of an equity minded classroom? Simpson tells us over and over that storytelling removes shame and leads to resurgence, a political act that results in a reconciliation of self that makes one proud of their culture and identity. This is what Paula Farrar and Bell Hooks call pedagogy of freedom. Brene Brown, scholar, researcher, author, podcast host, and TEDx presenter, is known for her research on shame. She conducted a longitudinal study on the effects of shame. This quantitative study follows students from grade school to high school to college. Her findings reveal the negative effects of shame has on student success. So step aside from my boring voice for a bit and watch Brene Brown's video. Just click on her image. It's an extra 33 minutes, um, so be sure to add those extra 33 minutes to your flex time. When we come to understand the concept and effects of ancestral storytelling, we will understand the need to create space for our students to read about, write about, and share their narratives. Simpson speaks not only for the indigenous, but for the historically marginalized. In an equity-minded classroom, students' culture, traditions, and identity are acknowledged, recognized, represented in readings, in images, and film. In turn, students feel valued enough to resist the negativity, resist the temptation to quit, so they feel the possibilities, shifting their fixed mindset into a growth mindset, no longer feeling humiliated, but decolonized. So we can abolish shame through storytelling. As Simpson states, it is shame that is rooted in the humiliation that colonialism has heaped on our peoples for hundreds of years and is now carried within our bodies, minds, and our hearts. Because we have been conditioned by the colonizer, shame travels through the generations and we are often unable to see our ancestors, their ways of thinking, being, and celebrating. Now that you have had some time to view and think about Brene's presentation, discussing how shame stifles self-worth, intelligence, and creativity, let's read a bit of Gloria Anzaldúa's essay, La Prieta. One of many stories in her anthology, The Bridge Called My Back, to show you how deeply embedded shame rests in the psyche. Anzaldúa wrote this after receiving her master's degree 
yet she still felt a sense of disconnection and was terrified. Feel free to use Anzaldúa's essay as an artifact for your students. Print it. There's a total of 14 pages. Uh, connect, excuse me, click on that La Prieta and um, the rest of the pages will, will link. Have students read and highlight lines or sections they relate to. Talk to the text, model your thoughts and annotations for your students. How do you relate to Anzaldúa? Follow this essay with Anzaldúa's list of contributions to feminist theory. I'm just gonna read a portion here. When I was born, Mama Grande Locha inspected my buttocks, looking for the dark blotch, the sign of Indio or worse, mulatto blood. My grandmother, Spanish, part German, the hint of royalty lying just beneath the surface of her fair skin, blue eyes, and the coils of her once blonde hair, would brag that her family was one of the first to settle in the range country of South Texas. Too bad Mijita was morena, muy prieta, so dark and different from her own fair-skinned children. But she loved Mijita anyway, what I lacked in whiteness, I had in smartness. But it was too bad I was dark, like an Indian. Don't go out in the sun, my mother would tell me when I wanted to play outside. If you get any darker, they'll mistake you for an Indian. And don't get dirt on your clothes. You don't want people to say you're a dirty Mexican. It never dawned on her that though six generations American, we were still Mexican and that all Mexicans are part Indian. I passed my adolescence combating her incessant orders to bathe my body, scrub the floors and cupboards, clean the windows and the walls. I want to pause for a moment. Imagine that this image is what lies behind the smile of a student who feels a lack of self-worth who was terrified at the start of the semester, disconnected from their stories of resistance. I invite you to walk students through our campus well link. Noting the link on the syllabus is sometimes not enough. So I added the link here, uh, lower right hand corner, it says campus well. Um, I don't know who put it together, but my gosh, it's just a, an excellent, excellent site. And um, I'm sure the students will find it a great resource. So kudos to whoever put all that together. It's beautiful, beautifully done. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about storytelling as a theoretical framework uh, in an effort to create a just reality. In his work, Cree Narrative Memory, Cree scholar Neil MacLeod writes that storytelling is a rebellious act of holding on to what was prohibited, one's own language and ways of being. So at its core, decolonizing, because it is a process of remembering, visioning, and creating a just reality, making storytelling the lens through which we can envision our way out of cognitive imperialism. And I repeat, Storytelling is a rebellious act of holding on to what was prohibited. Even today, the silencing of marginalized voices continues through the banning of books. Here are a few banned books which differ from state to state. The banning of books is an act of silencing the historically marginalized, their voices, their language, their stories. How do you think the students feel who see themselves in these books and know that they are banned? This book has been banned in Arizona. It's been banned for quite some time. It's actually um, one of my favorite books I read. I've, I have, I think the original copy I've had since the eighties, um, banned in Arizona. And here's just a quick excerpt. Leaders who do not act dialogically, but insist on imposing their decisions, do not organize the people, they manipulate them. They do not liberate, nor are they liberated. They oppress. Paulo Ferra, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Died by that. In 1972, 50 years ago, 
the resolution on students' rights to their own language was adopted. Dr. Lisa William broadcast this link a few weeks ago, and I invite you to read and reread it at the start of each semester so we may self-reflect on these words. I won't read the entire article, but I will begin with, we affirm. We affirm the student's right to their own patterns and varieties of language, the dialects of their nurture, or whatever dialects in which they find their own identity and style. Language scholars long ago denied that the myth of the standard American dialect has any validity. The claim that any one dialect is unacceptable amounts to an attempt of one social group to exert its dominance over another. Such a claim leads to false advice for speakers and writers and immoral advice for humans. A nation proud of its diverse heritage and its cultural and racial variety will preserve its heritage of dialects. We affirm strongly that teachers must have the experiences and training that will enable them to respect diversity and uphold the right of students to their own language. Decolonizing through an indigenous lens means to pick up the things we were forced to leave behind, songs, dances, values, or philosophies, and bring them into existence. And that's where the resurgence comes in. That's where the reimagining comes in. We must not spend all our time interrogating and criticizing. We need to spend an enormous amount of energy recovering and rebuilding at this point. Highlight the positive in each other's work and save our criticisms for the forces that continually try to rip us apart. But again, the emphasis is placed, the enormous amount of energy is placed on recovering and rebuilding. So the recovering and the rebuilding starts with storytelling. The recovering and rebuilding for our students who are frightened starts with storytelling, with being acknowledged in the classroom and in the readings that they are assigned. The social movement theory is inadequate because it's rooted in Western knowledge. It ignores indigenous political culture, ignores historical context of indigenous resistance. When resistance is defined solely as large scale political mobilization, we miss much of what has kept the languages, cultures, and systems of governments alive. Simpson makes reference to one of Audre Lorde's quotes, the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house. Simpson's focus is not on dismantling the master's house. Rather, she wants energy spent on visioning and building our new house. So reflecting on what you have read, seen, and or heard so far, what do you think Simpson means? And if we were in a regular Zoom session, this would be one of the breakout questions. As a matter of fact, there will be several breakout questions uh, in the past uh, slides, but um, here we are. The power of story. So I'm sure that most of you already know this, so please forgive me. I'm just going to throw it out there again. And I encourage you uh, to insert yourself into stories, to select stories, books, essays. Like for instance, I selected La Prieta and um, because I connected with that story. And I know a lot of my students, a majority of my students in every class I presented that story have connected with it in one way or another. And I'm talking about all genders, non-genders as well, they've connected. So, um, I do encourage you to print that particular story and, and read it. So when stories are interpreted as drawing individuals into the resurgence narrative on their own terms for a moment, they are complete in the absence of want, decolonizing one moment at a time. Once new knowledge is embodied, one that validates the familial experience, like La Prieta, there is no limit to the student's ability to achieve 
and to succeed because they know they're not alone because they know that they're not the only one who's had this kind of experience and that once they make that connection I mean, it was definitely a wake-up call for me. So it's like, whoa, okay. So I wasn't the only one that uh, somebody was checking, you know, for the blotch. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So thank you. What better way to decolonize yourself than to read books that enhance your perspective? Here are a few that I found most helpful, and these are just my personal choices. There are, I probably had at least 25 books listed, but I just pulled quite a few out because there is just too many, and I won't be able to talk about every single one of these, but I'll just give you a really quick snippet of a few of them. Deborah Miranda's Bad Indians is research and fact-based, and it totally changed my perception about California's fourth grade mission project. Amazon allows you to peek read the first few pages of most of these books, so go for it. Deloria's book, Custer Died for Your Sins, is a collection of essays told with wit and wisdom and ironic Indian point of view about U.S. race relations, uh, federal bureaucracies, Christianity, and social scientists. Erdrich's, I hope I pronounced it right, book. She has several books out there. This is um, one of the, the reads I found um, quite delightful, actually. Uh, it's a page turner. It's a ghost story. There's a lot of indigenous um, wits, a lot of clever sayings, and it's very, very honest. And I just really love this book. Uh, I want to read it again. Uh, now, Linda Tuhiwe Smith's book, Decolonizing Methodologies, is a call to shift away from the inequities of Western academic assessment and methodology and lean toward the indigenous way. The book begins with the line, the word itself research is probably one of the dirtiest words in the indigenous world's vocabulary. Smith shows how Western research is, quote, inextricably linked to European imperialism and colonialism, end quote. Stamped from the beginning is a longish book, yet a must read at least twice. Author Abram X. Kendi not only changed my way of seeing the world, but he moved me to feel and experience the struggle and ongoing injustices, injustices experienced by historically marginalized, specifically black people, throughout the history of the United States. Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks, Education as a Practice of Freedom from Teaching to Transgress, and just the title alone, need I say more? She's amazing. Um, Feldman. Feldman's Grading for Equity provides a different approach to effective grading and assessing student work. I've incorporated some of his strategies in my pedagogy with great success. Zaretta Hammond wrote, Joe Feldman shows us how we can use grading to help students become the leaders of their own learning and lift the veil on how to succeed. This must have book will help teachers learn to implement equity in the classroom. So um, if you have any questions on any of these books, uh, please let me know and I would love to talk to you about them um, and they, these are just really wonderful books. Again, Bad Indians, um, I recommend that as a first read. Uh, it's a memoir and it's uh, very powerful. So I'm really tired, I don't know about you, but um, I hope that you have an opportunity to continue with the rest of the, the slides. There's a few left. And here we go. Okay, this slide looks familiar. Here is a quick review of seven elements that make up an equity-minded classroom. I invite you to think about the following questions. What do you plan to do differently this semester? I realize it is a bit late for any kind of real change. However, take a moment to think about how you can integrate a snippet of student ancestral storytelling, something that represents them, into your curriculum. What new books or lessons would you like to add to your pedagogy next semester? Small things matter. For example, I typically, I typically start class with a positive culturally relevant thought or image or even just a two minute clip. 
For example, I added a two-minute news clip in the lower right-hand corner discussing the farm workers' march that's happening right now. Check it out. It's only two minutes. The following video clips can be used to broaden student perspective while instilling an equity-minded classroom. And um, I hope that you find them useful. Here's a 15 minute video of the 1968 blowout with Sal Castro and his high school students. Now this is a very powerful video and I'll probably use the word powerful a lot and I'm really sorry because it just is what it is. Um, but I do encourage you and invite you to please use this in your classroom if you have the opportunity. Um, when I show this in my class, uh, it never fails. There are always several students who either are in tears or either become is so inspired and tell me why were they not told about this before? Why isn't this taught in high school? And so they become, they stand up a little taller and they become a little more uh, courageous and want to advocate. So this is just a powerful uh, film and I hope that if you have not watched it, please do so and uh, integrate it in your class if you get the opportunity or if it fits uh, your curriculum. If you have not heard of Chimamanda Adichie, um, this will be a treat for you. I have been using her 19 minute uh, video TED Talk in every single class probably in the last uh, 10 years. She's amazing, great speaker, and she talks about the dangers of a single story. She talks about herself as a storyteller and how the power of storytelling. So this, def this video definitely fits in with the indigenous lens of my that type of mindset. So I am so happy if you have not heard of her that I'm going to introduce her to you. And I hope you have an opportunity to watch her as soon as you can. Here is a link for an interview with Deborah Miranda, author of Bad Indians a well-researched historical memoir. After reading her story, I was deeply humbled, and I now have an entirely different perspective of the effects Mission Bells have on our Indigenous people. I invite you to view her video and then read the article in the lower right-hand corner. I encourage you to look up her book in Amazon if you don't have it already. Amazon offers a sneak peek reading of the introduction. On page nine in Aranda's book, she states, the bell is the voice of the Padres. We woke to bells, bells for midday meal, bells return us to our neighbors. Bells demand prayers or instruction, bells determine evening meal, bells give us permission to sleep. Okay, here's the final video. It's 11 minutes long. It is about the Oka crisis, which occurred back in 1990. Now that's not to say that there have not been any more violent acts upon the indigenous, but um, I wanted to share this very brief story because I wanted you to understand or to, to see, to perceive through the eyes of a young lady and the, the courage, the resilience, the tenacity, the, the love, that she has for self, for for her people. And so I think it's just really important. And I think that she is definitely a role model because there is something that she's, her, her mother had said, um, you were not raised to be anybody's victim. And that was a powerful statement because that's exactly what I was told when I was a little girl at seven, eight years old. You were not raised to be anybody's victim. In other words, stop crying and stop feeling sorry for yourself. Do something. So I wanted to share this uh, video clip with you.